You know how it worked, that plan, and what it did to people? Try pouring water into a tank where there's a pipe at the bottom, draining it out faster than you pour it, and each bucket you bring breaks that pipe an inch wider, and the harder you work, the more is demanded of you, and you stand slinging buckets forty hours a week, then forty-eight, then fifty-six, for your neighbor's supper, for his wife's operation, for his child's measles, for his mother's wheelchair, for his uncle's shirt, for his nephew's schooling, for the baby next door, for the baby to be born, for anyone anywhere around you. It's theirs to receive from diapers to dentures, and yours to work from sun up to sundown, month after month, year after year, with nothing to show for it but your sweat, with nothing in sight for you but their pleasure, for the whole of your life without rest, without hope, without end. From each according to his ability to each according to his need. We're all one big family, they told us. We're all in this together. But you don't all stand working at a settling torch ten hours a day, together. And you don't all get a bellyache, together. What's whose ability? And which of whose needs comes first? When it's all in one pot, you can't let any man decide what his own needs are, can you? If you did, he might claim that he needs a yacht. And if his feelings is all you have to go by, he might prove it, too. Why not? If it's not right for me to own a car until I've worked myself into a hospital ward, earning a car for every other loafer and every naked savage on earth, why can't he demand a yacht from me, too, if I still have the ability not to have collapsed? No? He can't? Then why can he demand that I go without cream for my coffee until he's replastered his living room? Oh, well... Well, anyway, it was decided that nobody had the right to judge his own need or ability. We voted on it. Yes, ma'am, we voted on it in a public meeting twice a year. How else could it be done? You care to think what would happen at such a meeting? It took us just one meeting to discover that we had become beggars, rotten, whining, sniveling beggars, all of us, because no man could claim his pay as his rightful earning. He had no rights and no earnings. His work didn't belong to him. It belonged to the family and they owed him nothing in return, and the only claim he had on them was his need. So he had to beg in public for relief from his needs, like any lousy moocher, listing all his troubles and miseries, down to his patched drawers and his wife's head colds, hoping that the family would throw him the alms. He had to claim miseries, because it's miseries, not work, that had become the coin of the realm. So it turned into a contest among six thousand panhandlers, each claiming that his need was worse than his brother's. How else could it be done? Do you care to guess what happened? What sort of men kept quiet, feeling shame, and what sort got away with a jackpot? But that wasn't all. There was something else that we discovered at the same meeting. The factory's production had fallen by forty percent in that first half year. So it was decided that somebody hadn't delivered according to his ability. Who? Oh, how could you tell it? The family voted on that, too. They voted which men were the best, and these men were sentenced to work overtime each night for the next six months. Overtime, without pay, because you weren't paid by time and you weren't paid by work, only by need. Do I have to tell you what happened after that, and into what sort of creatures we all started turning? We, who had once been human... We began to hide whatever ability we had to slow down and watch like hawks that we never worked any faster or better than the next fellow. What else could we do when we knew that if we did our best for the family, it's not thanks or rewards that we'd get but punishment? We knew that for every stinker who'd ruin a batch of motors and cost the company money, either through his sloppiness because he didn't have to care, or through plain incompetence, it's we who'd have to pay with our nights and our Sundays. So we did our best to be no good. There was one young boy who started out full of fire for the noble idea, a bright kid without any schooling but with a wonderful head on his shoulders. First year he figured out a work process that saved us thousands of man-hours. He gave it to the family. Didn't ask anything for it either, couldn't ask, but that was all right with him. It was for the ideal, he said. But when he found himself voted as one of our ablest and sentenced to night work because we hadn't gotten enough from him, he shut his mouth and his brain. You can bet he didn't come up with any ideas the second year. What was it they'd always told us about the vicious competition of the profit system where men had to compete for who'd do a better job than his fellows? Vicious, wasn't it? Well, they should have seen what it was like when we all had to compete with one another for who'd do the worst job possible. 
There's no surer way to destroy a man than to force him into a spot where he has to aim at not doing his best, where he has to struggle to do a bad job day after day. That will finish him quicker than drink or idleness or pulling stick-ups for a living. But there was nothing else for us to do except to fake unfitness. The one accusation we feared was to be suspected of ability. Ability was like a mortgage on you that you could never pay off. And what was there to work for? You knew that your basic pittance would be given to you anyway, whether you worked or not. Your housing and feeding allowance, it was called. And above that pittance, you had no chance to get anything, no matter how hard you tried. You couldn't count on buying a new suit of clothes next year. They might give you a clothing allowance, and they might not, according to whether nobody broke a leg, needed an operation, or gave birth to more babies. And if there wasn't enough money for new suits for everybody, then you couldn't get yours either. There was one man who'd worked hard all his life, because he'd always wanted to send his son through college. Well, the boy graduated from high school in the second year of the plan, but the family wouldn't give the father any allowance for the college. They said his son couldn't go to college until we had enough to send everybody's sons to college, and that we first had to send everybody's children through high school, and we didn't even have enough for that. The father died the following year in a knife fight with somebody in a saloon, a fight over nothing in particular. Such fights were beginning to happen among us all the time. Then there's an old guy, a widower with no family, who had one hobby, phonograph records. I guess that was all he ever got out of life. In the old days, he used to skip meals just to buy himself some new recording of classical music. Well, they didn't give him any allowance for records, personal luxury, they called it. But at that same meeting, Millie Bush, somebody's daughter, a mean, ugly little eight-year-old, was voted a pair of gold braces for her buck teeth. This was medical need because the staff psychologist had said that the poor girl would get an inferiority complex if her teeth weren't straightened out. The old guy who loved music turned to drink instead. He got so you never saw him fully conscious anymore. But it seems like there was one thing he couldn't forget. One night he came staggering down the street, saw Millie Bush, swung his fist, and knocked all her teeth out, every one of them. Drink, of course, was what we all turned to. Some more, some less. Don't ask how we got the money for it. When all the decent pleasures are forbidden, there's always ways to get the rotten ones. You don't break into grocery stores after dark, and you don't pick your fellow's pockets by classical symphonies or fishing tackle. But if it's to get stinking drunk and forget, you do. Fishing tackle, hunting guns, snapshot cameras, hobbies. There wasn't any amusement allowance for anybody. Amusement was the first thing they dropped. Aren't you always supposed to be ashamed to object when anybody asks you to give up anything? If it's something that gave you pleasure, even our tobacco allowance was cut to where we got two packs of cigarettes a month. And this, they told us, was because the money had to go into the baby's milk fund. Babies was the only item of production that didn't fall, but rose and kept on rising, because people had nothing else to do, I guess, and because they didn't have to care. The baby wasn't their burden. It was the family's. In fact, the best chance you had of getting a raise and breathing easier for a while was a baby allowance. Either that or a major disease. It didn't take as long to see how it all worked out. Any man who tried to play straight had to refuse himself everything. He lost his taste for any pleasure. He hated to smoke a nickel's worth of tobacco or chew a stick of gum, worrying whether somebody had more need for that nickel. He felt ashamed of every mouthful of food he swallowed wondering whose weary nights of overtime had paid for it, knowing that his food was not his by right, miserably wishing to be cheated rather than to cheat, to be a sucker, but not a blood sucker. He wouldn't marry. He wouldn't help his folks back home. He wouldn't put an extra burden on the family. Besides, if he still had some sort of sense of responsibility, he couldn't marry or bring children into the world, when he could plan nothing, promise nothing, count on nothing. But the shiftless and the irresponsible had a field day of it, they bred babies, they got girls into trouble, they dragged in every worthless relative they had from all over the country, every unmarried pregnant sister, for an extra disability allowance. They got more sicknesses than any doctor could disprove. They ruined their clothing, their furniture, their homes. What the hell? The family was paying for it. They found more ways of getting in need than the rest of us could ever imagine. They developed a special skill for it, which was the only ability they showed. God help us, ma'am. Do you see what we saw? We saw that we'd been given a law to live by, a moral law, they called it, which punished those who observed it, for observing it. The more you tried to live up to it, the more you suffered. The more you cheated it, the bigger rewards you got. 
Your honesty was like a tool left at the mercy of the next man's dishonesty. The honest ones paid, the dishonest collected. The honest lost, the dishonest won. How long could men stay good under this sort of a law of goodness? We were a pretty decent bunch of fellows when we started. There weren't many chiselers among us. We knew our jobs and we were proud of it. And we worked for the best factory in the country, where old man Starnes hired nothing but the pick of the country's labor. Within one year under the new plan, there wasn't an honest man left among us. That was the evil, the sort of hell, horror, evil that preachers used to scare you with, which you never thought to see alive. Not that the plan encouraged a few bastards, but that it turned decent people into bastards, and there was nothing else that it could do, and it was called a moral ideal.